morning, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. My name is Todd Ashby, as Eric, as Eric mentioned. I'm the director at the Point Area Metropolitan Planning Organization. And I have to say it's great to see so many people interested in housing this morning. A lot of credit for that is due to the work that Polk County Housing Trust Fund does and, and continues to do an excellent job in elevating the community discussion on housing and the critical role it plays in the vitality of the region. So thank you, Eric Burmeister, and, and his excellent staff for everything you do. I'd also like to thank them for making this event part of the Tomorrow Fine Speaking Series. And as Eric mentioned, as well as our sponsors, <coughs> the Iowa Chapter of the American Planning Association, and the Urban, Institute, uh, Urban Land Institute of Iowa. The Tomorrow Plan is a roadmap uh, for the region for sustainable development for the Grand Des Moines region through 2050. And the Speaker Series is an implementation strategy for that, bringing national thought leaders to the region so we can help guide our community and work to implement this plan. Today's event is a great example of that. One of the strategies outlined in the plan is to, get, is to talk about the development of diverse housing options in terms of cost, style, and location throughout the region. So we're very pleased to have Maya Brennan here from the Urban Institute. Maya Brennan engages in research, analysis, stakeholder engagement as a part of the uh, policy advisory group of the Urban Institute. Her research interests include community-based partnerships, vulnerable populations, and community change, and the connection between housing and well-being. She manages the group's How Housing Matters projects, which provide rigorous research and uh, practical information on the connection between housing, neighborhoods, and individual outcomes. She has a very important message that is timely for us to consider today. Given how fast the Moines, greater Moines region is growing, she cautions us about the risk of overheating the housing market and pricing out our essential members of our workforce. He says, now is the time for the region's leaders to plan for the right mix of housing to ensure the region continues to be economically strong and a place where all people can thrive. Please join me in welcoming Maya Brennan. Thanks, everybody. And uh, thanks, Todd. That was that was wonderful. I um, Well, good morning. I'm good morning. thrilled to be here. Yeah, let's let's have a nice uh, get, get yourselves engaged. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. Excellent. Um, I am thrilled to be here in Des Moines to celebrate Affordable Housing Week with all of you and to participate in the Tomorrow Plan. Um, as I started to think about the idea of the Tomorrow Plan and what's needed for Des Moines and the greater Des Moines area, I also thought. Of a, of a, a modest rebrand of it of the today and tomorrow plan because there are a lot of challenges that we continue to need to address today and those challenges will only become greater if we don't think about what we need for tomorrow. So I'm in from uh, Washington DC and when I got here I uh, landed, saw, uh, you know, wow, there's a lot of cranes, there's a lot of development. The things that I've been hearing about Des Moines from afar are, are true. Um, I went over to the East Village and saw, um, saw the kind of quirky zombie burger and the, the cranes there, and I thought, you know, this is not so different from the formerly struggling areas within <coughs> the District of Columbia or within Baltimore or within Kalamazoo or within a variety of places it's all at different scales. Um, change is constantly coming. Um, risk takers see some assets, reinvent a community, and build something great. Word gets out and demand starts to rise. So change is always happening around us, and housing has to be a part of that. Um, meeting the needs of the local workforce and providing a place to grow up, a place to retire, a place to dream up possibilities, or a place to just rest and regroup. Um, housing also plays an important role, as I'm here to describe more about today, in supporting a regional economy and allowing the people in the region to make economic progress. And both of those really go hand in hand, a lot more so than we sometimes realize. Um, now, at the Urban Institute, I wear two hats. Uh, one is that of a researcher, and in that role I'm you know, designing questionnaires and building methodologies and going on site visits and conducting interviews, all that sort of side of, of things. The other hat as the editor of HowHousingMatters.org and the work on the How Housing Matters initiative is more about being this 
odd blend of a research navigator, a communicator, the connector, the blogger. Uh, I'm scanning uh, evidence from a wide array of different sources, trying to communicate that out to people who have no interest after graduating from school in opening up a journal. And, uh, and that research is not just my own, it's not just that of the colleagues at the Urban Institute, it's not just that of the um, uh, folks who have gotten How Housing Matters research grants, it's also that of uh, the, the world writ large. Now I'm going to try to see about getting this clicker moving, okay. Yay! Um, this is the, the two things when you travel and speak. It's like, did the plane land? Does the clicker work? Um, I guess if you check bags, is my bag in? Um, so here's a, a glimpse of the How Housing Matters website. The, the site is funded by the MacArthur Foundation, as is a lot of the work on How Housing Matters. Um, and you, I would encourage you to go and visit the site, to sign up for the newsletter for the site, to keep getting the information from it. And what you'll find is an array of research that is all summarized in a really clear and actionable way, as well as a variety of stories. Some of them communities struggling with issues just like yours and kind of tackling exactly how did they manage to get more housing uh, for the missing middle, more housing at a variety of levels. Uh, service-enriched housing, partnerships, and so on. Uh, so today, I'm really here not as a researcher presenting my, my own work. I would encourage you later to talk to all of the student researchers presenting their own work. Um, I'm not going to try to tell you more numbers about Iowa and Des Moines that they're going to have better and that you all are going to have better. I'm going to share a lot more from uh, kind of taking a tour of this How Housing Matters body of work with a focus on economic health for both the region and its people, and we can talk more about what that means for Iowa. So the first thing um, that I, that I want to kind of put as a stake in the ground is we all realized during the mortgage foreclosure crisis that housing truly matters for the economy. Mortgage foreclosures morphed into a national and global economic crisis, the importance of housing for the economy at that point was all too clear. A functioning housing sector supports a variety of other industries. It supports the national economy. It supports the fiscal health of states, counties, and cities. But also, severe dysfunction in a housing sector can have a wide variety of impacts. It affected retirees' pensions and investments. It affected the states funding those pensions. It affected homeowners' ability to move to access other job markets, creating an even worse unemployment crisis. And according to recent research that uh, came out through the How Housing Matters initiative, the related blight from mortgage foreclosures actually harmed children's kindergarten readiness. So when we think about tomorrow, one of the things that we need to think about is if kids are not getting into school ready to learn, where is the economy? Where is that workforce of the future? Um, now, the nation's communities are still recovering, uh, even as we face a new widespread housing challenge now, that of access and affordability. And when I think about access and affordability, and thinking about the housing market, I'd like to kind of slice it into, into three segments. There are people who are in the housing market, we've got our, our current homeowners, We've got the, the folks that are able to live in the community, stably, secure, know that if they need to find another place, they're gonna have one. Their homeowners are able to build assets, renters are, are not paying too much and have access to their, to their job. Everything's functioning well for the folks that are, that are in. There's the folks that are out of the housing market and um, to some degree, that's the folks that are struggling with homelessness um, but it's also, at a lesser degree, the folks that are out of the housing market are the ones that decided that that job in Iowa looked great, but I'm going to be in Nebraska instead. Or that job in Des Moines looks great, but I can't afford anything really close by, so I'm going to spend a long time driving to get in, or I'm going to not access the, the community that has the best needs for my family. So those are the ones that are kind of out. 
And then you've got those who are struggling to stay afloat. And when I think about um, the households that are struggling to stay afloat, that includes an awful lot of renters because frankly, if the housing market heats up and rents rise, there is no assurance of what that renter will need to pay in the next year and, and longer into the future. But it also includes those who are struggling with housing cost burdens, with quality problems, with unaffordability. Um, so we truly need to think about ensuring that all three of those segments are in our minds when we're thinking about how to move forward uh, for the needs of Iowa, the needs of greater Des Moines. Now for all of the stages of life and every household budget, whether you're in this in, out, or trying to stay afloat categories, communities need suitable housing options. You need a full menu. When I go out, I'm not thinking, I want to go to a place that only offers spaghetti that with sauce and that's it. I'm, you know, I, I grew up, I, as I said, I live in DC now, but I grew up in New Jersey. New Jersey's really famous for its diners and the diner menu is like 12 pages long. You want to have something for everybody. Everybody is always happy if there's something there for them. You need rental housing, ownership housing, you need attached housing and detached housing, multifamily, you need homes that are the right size for a single person, all the way up through a larger family, homes that fit an extremely limited budget, as is uh, so true both for older adults and for those who are, are struggling to, um, to get an adequate job or still working on their education. Those that fit a modest budget and those that fit a more robust one. Uh, we need homes for people who want to be rooted in the community and those for people always seeking the next adventure. So having a sufficient and sufficiently diverse supply of housing matters for local and regional economies. Because without affordable housing options, without appropriate housing options, new household formation lags, employers struggle to compete for workers, and opportunities are stifled. When a supply shortage drives up home prices, the only ones who benefit are those who have already bought in. Even then, they may be short on options if their housing needs change. So in many ways, this is a market problem. Republicans and Democrats alike have called for reducing regulatory barriers that impede the housing supply, and, and doing that, addressing the many different factors that drive up the costs of development and the costs of rehab, will go a long way toward ensuring that the middle-income households are not priced out of American communities. But in other ways, this is a non-market problem. The cost of development or acquisition of essential maintenance and repairs can only come down so much with regulatory reform alone. So the image that you're looking at here is from a penciling out tool that some colleagues at Urban and at the National Housing Conference created. It shows the gap that a developer would have to fill in order to build housing for a median income household in a typical mid-market city. They grab data from uh, from Denver and put it in because Denver um, tends to perform a lot like a, a relatively typical city with uh, growing housing demand at, at present. That's common across the U.S. at this point. So the numbers here are illustrative. Don't, don't think of this as the exact actual dollar value gap for a Des Moines developer. But that said, it helps to explain why we're seeing um, a gap in the unsubsidized but non-luxury housing stock. There's a lot of money in deficit that you would need to make up if you're trying to build for, in this case, 100% of area median income. So we're not even talking about lower income households. There is a gap just to create housing with rents that are affordable for that segment. So it gives us a target also, though, to think about how, how much, how big the regulatory reforms might have to be if that was the only place we were going with. Now, the gap obviously is even larger when we look at households earning 60% of area median income. So even if we assume that the larger building in this case is uh, sufficiently competitive to get tax credits, there is still that gap that remains at the top. Now, in the absence of some form of intervention, these are households that, that can't pay market rents and have few choices of what else to do. We don't have an entitlement to a housing subsidy, housing assistance. Um, 
we don't have the ability for the market to just to just make it up in the, the current housing supply. So what, what does the household do if they're not one of the lucky one in four um, who is receiving federal rental assistance? They could um, choose to spend too much of their budget on housing. In that case, they would be opting to crowd out food, crowd out health care, retirement savings, child enrichment activities. Um, they would potentially put themselves on a road to some of the problems that you see described up here leading to eviction, leading to homelessness. Um, they could choose to accept a substandard quality unit. Plenty of people do that. Um, that can potentially put you on a path to injury and illness. Housing-related asthma episodes are particularly common in association with older, uh, poorly reinvested units. Um, lead poisoning, obviously, fire hazards, mental and behavioral health issues. There, in all of the cases that I'm talking about, there is a wide variety of research evidence and studies that you can find through the How Housing Matters site, and I'd be um, happy to share if, if you need uh, links to any of these particular things. They may also choose not just uh, to pay too much, not just uh, substandard housing, but to live in an unsuitable neighborhood. That's another thing that's particularly common. In the best case, that may be simply a neighborhood that's unsuitable because it's too far from work, um, and the commute is too, is too long to get there or to get to your routine appointments. In worst cases, though, uh, the neighborhood challenges may affect health and safety. You may have uh, proximity to traffic hazards, um, to toxins, sometimes from traffic uh, exhaust, sometimes from other, from other issues, the toxins in the air and water that affect children's long-term earnings as well as health uh, for, for everybody in the, the, the short term. Or there may be crime and violence issues, and all of these have a combination of immediate effects and effects that follow children uh, into adulthood. You may also opt to crowd into too small a home. You know, the quality's fine, but you're really squeezed in. And all of that, there's a body of research that suggests affects interpersonal relationships, schooling, mental, and behavioral health. So now, it may sound like I've strayed kind of far off course from the topic of housing matters to Iowa's economy, but I promise you I haven't, because the consequences of the lack of safe, decent, and affordable housing options are paid for. They're paid for by taxpayers who are paying for the costs of eviction and homelessness in the emergency systems. Uh, they are paid for by employers who are not able to attract a sufficient workforce, and they're paid for by society writ large and the outcomes that you see here. So the way to avoid these costs is to acknowledge the need for intervention, the need for intervention by public and private and nonprofit sectors. In this example here, I played with the numbers, and I, there is no long-term permanent subsidy that's tenant-based in the, the figures that I've shown up here. I had to layer in a lot of other supports, though. I had to get a uh, reduced interest rate loan. I had to make sure that there were enough tax credits to actually spread around so that both of these would be competitive. Um, I had to make sure that there were regulatory reforms that brought down some of the construction costs and had to ensure that there was donated land from somebody, whether public sector, private, or nonprofit, who saw that that was an essential part of getting housing where they needed it. So again, the numbers are illustrative. There's no real like magic here. I could have said, well, there's also research that says acquisition rehab tends to cost less than new construction, all other things being equal. Um, what if we did something like that? What if we, you know, it, the, the, the list of what ifs kind of goes on and on. All of this is important. Thinking about the, the layers, thinking about the variety of partners for ensuring an appropriate housing supply for low and moderate income households, because we're not going to be able to reach them with those regulatory reforms alone, although those regulatory reforms are a core part of the puzzle in most areas. Um, doing that, filling this gap at 60% of AMI, even at 100% of AMI, of AMI would go a long way toward retaining and attracting essential workers for the community. And employers are bringing these types of issues to the attention of their elected officials all across the country. Um, and going to, you, you can always look at the, the, the ULI site for the ULI Terwilliger Center for Housing has uh, Larson Policy Awards. The state of Iowa, as I'm sure you know, was a finalist last year in that. You can scan through some of those and see examples of what other communities have done. Um, Palm Beach County, Florida, found that 
the cost of housing there was making it so that employers were coming to them and saying, we're unable to attract people. People are going to other jurisdictions. The planning department felt the burn of it themselves when they were trying to attract a new planning develop a planning director. And the planning director decided to go two counties over instead and take a job there where it's actually more affordable. Asheville, North Carolina hasn't yet risen into the uh, uh, Larson Awards as far as I uh, know, but in Asheville, North Carolina, there is a coalition happening right now of employers trying to work out what exactly they're going to do, because even though uh, the area is not your you know, high cost New York, DC, Boston, San Francisco, the costs there were starting to become a hindrance to employers. Um, in North Dakota, similar, similar things happened, believe it or not, uh, in, in North Dakota, even in Baltimore, employers are getting into the mix, into the uh, conversations and pushing for housing improvements, housing affordability, and ensuring that this essential supply is there. Now remember, the consequences are paid for. You know, so if we're putting dollars in, those dollars may have a return on investment. Um, in Iowa and the rest of the country, households are earning households are earning 30% of AMI or less. Those that we didn't talk about in those other pictures where we could potentially fill the gap and off in other ways are having an extremely difficult time finding affordable housing. And the light shading on the map at the right shows, uh, shows that. The map at the left shows federal rental assistance and how that can help house, make more housing affordable to these extremely low-income households. Um, but still, too many communities are bearing the consequences of housing instability and the poor outcomes and the direct fiscal losses that come in the form of emergency services, unpaid municipal bills, etc. So cost-benefit analysis have been really effective in making the case around chronic homelessness and the need to end that. We also have enough evidence at this point to show that cost-benefit analysis should work around family homelessness. The proof of concept is largely there already for the need for affordable housing for uh, extremely low-income households and that having cost benefits. And I would encourage any of the students here thinking about future research projects to think about monetizing some of this research, monetizing those studies, and showing the return on investment here. It's been particularly effective in, in other communities that have tried to, to go about this with kind of social program uh, support issues, say, you know, early childhood education in, in, in Minnesota, for example, like proving the return on investment on that is trying to make it a lot more competitive against other things that come before elected officials' desks. Um, housing of problems affect every state. Um, they affect the, the, the budgets everywhere. Same holds true for Des Moines, but especially in areas with growing demand. And so, you know, you know growing describes Des Moines, the fastest growing city in the Midwest, the metro area is adding people, it's adding jobs, but the housing market, both for owners and for renters, remains tight. Um, to maintain quality of life, to stay competitive with employers, and to avoid costly housing challenges that I was describing earlier, you need to make sure that the housing supply both comes into balance and then stays balanced. And we're not just talking at a macro level, just ensuring kind of rental and home ownership is there. But all across the menu. Getting the balance right, adjusting to maintain that over time can ensure that a full array of people who call this area home or people who hope to have a place here and can thrive here. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, the job of addressing housing affordability really largely falls to you. The budget cuts proposed in Washington will shift even more of the responsibility to states and localities. Um, unless you want to fight to not just preserve, but actually expand current federal housing assistance, the solutions are going to take innovation and the solutions are going to take determination. So this might mean taking a page from some, some other communities who have struggled with, with similar issues. This might mean saying, okay, so what has, what has Connecticut done in its, uh, in its small Main Street areas, how can we apply that? What has, what has Palm Beach done? What have other places done? It also might mean 
setting up social impact investment opportunities in housing, saying, well, we don't have the funds to put into it completely ourselves. The federal government is not going to put any more money into it. So maybe we could build a pay for success deal that engages private investors in supporting improved housing out outcomes using all of this evidence that shows that it pays off in other social benefits and other fiscal benefits. You could commit to a review and reform of outdated regulations or red tape that drive up housing costs without actually generating equivalent benefits. I've seen some of the options around the room here. I, I sort of, I'm inclined to, um, I'm inclined to shave a little off of what I was going to say so that you can talk to the students more because I feel like I've, I've set up this like T that says, look at the solutions around the room and see if you find actions that are workable for you. But anyway, um, you could engage coalition of employers like they're working on in Asheville. Um, you could uh, think more about what are those locally workable solutions? What are the resources that you have? What are the places that are the impediments? And uh, I think ULI, Iowa, APA, the Metro Planning Coalition, you're all, you're all part of this and can bring the, that core of people together who can really craft the appropriate solution here. So maintaining Des Moines' appeal for essential workers, raising the economic prospects of your lowest income residents, they can go hand in hand you don't need to exclude others to keep the ones who are already in thriving. We can raise the boat. Uh, uh, we can ensure that the folks who are out of it can get into it. And we can ensure that everybody can truly stay afloat. Um, I'll, I'll want to close with a little thinking about, about messaging. Uh, so the How Housing Matters um, initiative uh, from from MacArthur has looked at what do people actually want? They've done a, a public opinion poll over a couple of years. What are people concerned about in housing? What do people want from their government? Do they see it as a government issue, as a private sector issue? Do they think the economy has improved or not? The last time they did this survey, they also asked specifically about different messages. Now, we know from a lot of other messaging research that the way that we talk about the challenge really matters and the way that we frame the issue really matters. So affordable housing, I feel comfortable talking about here. If I'm talking to somebody that I don't think is necessarily fully bought into the issue, it's you know housing that's affordable. Because we can all think of ourselves as being part of housing that's affordable. Um, when we think about why we need to be bought in, we need to be talking about this as a broad, full societal issue that it is. Because when my, um, when the receptionist at my office cannot afford housing in the community, it actually affects my employer, it affects me. When the person who works for the fire department can't afford housing in my community, that actually fully affects me. We need to think about all of the people that we engage with and interact with and need to on a day-to-day -day basis, and we need to think about all of the people involved in the jobs and the industries and realize that low-income, middle-income, and upper-income households all need to have a place here and scan and see that they do. But when we think about this message, some of the messages that were the most powerful were the ones that clarified that just really succinctly. So 70% of Americans nationally agreed that this message made them feel uh, support for affordable housing issues. Investing in affordable quality housing is investing in kids and their future. And this is not just, uh, you know, kind of DC spin messaging. This is truth that's backed up with hundreds of journal articles. Um, but we also know that when we put it clearly, without just slapping the journals down, uh, people can kind of get it more. So that, uh, with that, um, I want to close. I think you know we can all agree that this truly matters for Iowa's uh, long-term economic success. We can invest in housing in a variety of ways, with true dollars in, with changes, and with coalitions, and in doing that, 
will not just affect the economy today, workforce attraction for the future, but really your long-term success. So um, thank you very much for, for having me. And I wanna encourage you to take a brief uh, break, but a little bit longer of a break than you had planned. You got four minutes more to talk to the students because I thought that was, um, I thought that was really core. Cool. Everyone would return to their seats, would be much happier. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that's hired. Um, we'll, uh, we'll keep him as the guy who keeps the trains running on time. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Let's try again, just as you do. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good. Okay. Uh, welcome back to the second piece of our session. My name is Justin Platts. I am here on behalf of Willi, Iowa. I am the current chair. And if you will, please just uh, let me get through a few things that I am required to uh, to say. I'm related to Willi, Iowa. I really appreciate that. Um, the mission of the Urban Land Institute is to provide leadership and responsible use of land and in creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. And as many of you know, thriving communities know the value and importance of affordable housing. The availability of quality affordable housing is important to Iowa's future. It's not just a metro thing. Uh, ULI, Iowa's, ULI Iowa is very happy to partner with the Bolt County Housing Trust Fund, APA Iowa, the City of Des Moines, and the Des Moines Area MPO to bring you this morning's event. And we're proud to be a part of Affordable Housing Week. Over the next 50, 60 minutes or so, we anticipate you'll receive some valuable information in the form of pertinent facts, considered opinions, and meaningful dialogue. Now, uh, one quick statistic. I was, I was complimenting Maya on not going so far into statistics, but I, I do have one that I think is interesting um, as it applies to Iowa and uh, rural America overall. Uh, Low-income Americans living outside of cities are less, conf less confident than low-income city dwellers in their ability to, to afford the kind of home they want in the next five years. 34% of low-income suburbanites lack confidence in their ability to find affordable housing, as do 27% of low-income residents of rural areas and small towns, compared to 20% of low-income city dwellers. So it really does make a difference, particularly to a, a, a rural state like ours, from, even though it's predominantly, or it's, it's quickly moving towards the more metro. Uh, there's more information like this available on, on a couple of great sites. One is howhousingmatters.org. Really, really a great site. A lot of good information there. The other is uli.org. I encourage you to take a look at those, um, in particular the Terwilliger Center at ULI. Um, and I, I would also uh, I want to make a quick push here. If you are at all uh, interested in what it is you hear today, it is this is the type of thing that ULI does and is interested in, in pushing. So, if you are interested in becoming a member, as a private, on the private side or public side, there's some pretty good rates out there right now. You can check out www.iowa.uli.org. Okay, now to the fun stuff. Uh, we received a lot of thoughtful insights from Maya uh, in the last hour or so, and, and she is now going to switch from speaker to moderator and to take us through uh, discussing with her panel all the all things affordable housing as it relates to Iowa. So I'm going to introduce our panel now. We have. We'll start on the, on the far left and work our way back. We have uh, Russ Behrens, who is the city manager for the city of Grenada. We have Matt Anderson, who is the assistant city manager for the city of Des Moines. We have uh, uh, Carolyn Jensen, chief programs officer, Iowa Finance Authority. And then we have Sam Erickson, chief operating officer, community housing initiatives. So without further ado, Maya, please take it away. Thanks, Justin. And uh, I really do want to underscore how important it is to look at some of the resources he talked about. The work of, and it's not just because I used to be there, the work of the Terwilliger Center at, uh, at ULI and some of, the, some of the resources there and helping to understand the needs in rural communities, suburban communities, and urban communities, and really the preferences and what drives people and what gets them interested is uh, quite valuable. And, uh, so please do, please do talk to them about that. So, um, this panel here is gonna take us from that, that kind of high level national overview into a local view of how housing matters for workforce attraction and for economic opportunities in Iowa. The speakers reflect a variety of different roles, all involved in meeting the state's housing needs. They offer a variety of perspectives, local and regional and state, statewide um, thinking. So I'm gonna have them each introduce themselves a little bit more. 
uh, describe where their work fits into the broader Iowa housing landscape, although I understand you know, a, a, that may not be news to a lot of you here. We're all uh, kind of a, 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 group of, a group of friends with a, with, with a guest from the outside here. Um, and then we're gonna explore some local perspectives in more depth, think about the, the public, some decision makers' awareness of housing issues that affect economic health, and think about some opportunities for um, change. So why don't we start, why don't we start with you, Sam? Um, I'm Sam Erickson, I'm the Chief Operating Officer and Co-Founder of Community Housing Initiatives. We are Iowa's largest nonprofit housing development organization. Um, we've developed, we have approximately 1,515 units uh, now, and we're in from Council Bluffs to Clinton. Um, we serve communities uh, from 800 people uh, all the way to Des Moines. Um, but we do a lot of work in mid-size and smaller communities. Good morning, my name is Caroline Jensen. I'm with the Iowa Finance Authority. We are the State Housing Finance Authority. And our core focus is making affordable financing possible for home and community in Iowa. And we do lots of things. Uh, we do all things housing, home ownership, rental, and then also we do homeless programs. We also do a lot of community development, as in sewer, water, clean water, dirty water, any kind of water. So if you need anything, you just call us. Take care. Good morning. My name is Matt Anderson. I'm assistant city manager with the city of Des Moines. Um, I woke up this morning, I, when my alarm went off, I was actually dreaming that I had missed this panel. And, <laughs> and Josh over there in the corner in my dream had sent me 88 emails wondering where the, where the heck I was. So here, Josh, next time, after the first or second email, just call because 88 was a little. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, obviously I've been thinking about this panel. I'm excited about it. I don't get to do housing panels very often. They're more, they're more economic development, straight economic development panels. Um, my office, most of this city's economic development office is here uh, in this room right now, and a, a, a number of our community development uh, officials are here today, as long as Councilwoman uh, Christine Hensley. Um, in economic development office, uh, we are, our role in housing uh, really does pertain to workforce development and attraction. Um, a lot of what uh, what in the office of economic development, a lot of our our, our work is primarily focused on multifamily and downtown housing. Um, the community development staff members with the city who are here today uh, focus more on neighborhood and infill development. I can generally speak to both, um, but we do have some subject matter experts who can even grab anybody uh, and talk about some of the Des Moines specific issues afterward. Good morning. I'm Russ Barons. I'm the city manager in Grinnell, and I had no nightmares about this. <laughs> um, if you're the city manager in Grinnell, you're also in charge of housing development, economic development, um, so that's uh, part of the reason I'm here today. Um, we're fortunate in the community uh, that, I, that I represent that um, we, we've had really substantial job growth over the last, well, since the recession, basically. Um, but uh, one of the challenges we have is that we, we really don't have uh, the development expertise, uh, the economies of scale to develop uh, a lot of the housing options that we're missing there. So uh, that's one of the things we'll talk about. And most of the projects we have done there the last couple of years have been done by uh, people sitting in this room. So we'll be going through some of those. Thanks. So what, what we're going to do is I want to I want to dive really into the local lens with our representatives here from the Assistant City Manager of Des Moines and uh, uh, City Manager of Grinnell, kind of look, look at the how housing matters to the economy in these specific places, think a little bit about what your, your challenges and opportunities are, and then we're going to open up a little bit more to have a, a discussion here on the stage. So uh, Matt, do you want to sure. kick us off? Yes. So. Um, I'm going to talk five or six minutes. And my, I talk a lot, uh, so uh, cut me off, please. So, um, the most of my frame of reference is going to come from downtown housing. That's where I personally have done most of, uh, over the last 15 years. Most of my work and, and a lot of this economic development staff work has been downtown. But it's a it's a good um, it's a good uh, lab in which to study this. We have kind of an unwritten rule at the city of Des Moines that we that we want the downtown housing stock to mimic the downtown workforce. So whether you work in the service sector at one of the hotels, you're a 
fresh college graduate with your first job at Nationwide, or your middle management, or you're the CEO, we want, if you want to live downtown, we want to make sure that there is a place for you to live. Um, so that's kind of an unwritten goal that we've strived for. Um, and we've gone through different cycles in our downtown development, which really kicked off in the early 2000s. Um, when we kicked off that downtown housing, uh, we started with a lot of low-income housing tax credit projects. They were the, they were the bread and butter of what we did. Um, uh, developers such as George Sherman and Hubble Realty and Jack Hatch were really instrumental in bringing affordable housing, which hit that 60% of AMI really hit the sweet spot of what these uh, nationwide and Wells Fargo Financial who were adding buildings and adding jobs, it was the sweet spot of their, their labor force. Really easy to fill those up with uh, young kids out of college with their first job. Um, at that point in time, probably about 2008, 2010, um, we had this uh, this housing stock that was two thirds affordable downtown, two thirds affordable, one third market rate. And we started hearing from, as, as downtown was picking up momentum and it was becoming a, a destination of choice, people wanted to live downtown. With, with that much affordable housing downtown, there were, we were starting to squeeze out uh, higher income uh, earners or who wanted to live downtown but, but couldn't meet the income qualifications because they made too much money. So. Uh, we as staff and city council heard that, and that was kind of this undercurrent. So we started pushing developers and requesting of developers to bring in more and more uh, market rate housing. And the developers started noticing that our TIF policies and, and tax, our TIF policies in particular, uh, helped incent that. And we started swinging that pendulum away from uh, the, the big chunk of affordable housing to, um, to more market rate housing. And if you follow economic development, just real estate cycles in general, they go in cycles, and we always go too far one way, it seems. <laughs> and we've gone too far, in my view, uh, toward the market rate end of the spectrum. We need to bring things back in balance. We have 2,300 units uh, that will come online this year downtown, and um, currently in that pipeline, we're only 10% affordable, 90% market rate. And what that pipeline is doing is now, and I said before, we were two-thirds affordable. The stock, the inventory was two-thirds affordable, one-third market. We completely turned that on its ear. It's now one, it will be at the end of this year, approximately one-third affordable and two-thirds uh, uh, market rate. So we've gone too far. We need to start to bring the, the pendulum back in place. I'm hoping people at the, on this panel and you will have ideas on how we can bring that pendulum back into balance. Um, so one thing that does start to keep me up at night is uh, our service sector jobs and where do those people live? Um, we have, we're adding about a thousand new hotel rooms downtown. Those are some very low to mid uh, range uh, paying jobs. Uh, where are those people going to live? Um, they're going to have to, they, they can't afford to live downtown, so they're going to have to push out the geography further and further, which as you know, raises their travel expenses, their commuting expenses. So it's, it's really not sustainable. Um, we have a population that's changing in, in Iowa, particularly in Des Moines, as we have aging baby, baby boomers that we need to think of housing, a uh, growing immigrant population that I think probably on my, most of the city staff, we don't quite understand that and what are their needs. I think we need to look at that a little more closely. And then we're downtown, we're just trying, we're trying treading water, trying to keep our head above water to meet the millennial boom that's coming downtown as, as the 20-somethings and early 30-somethings have decided they want to live downtown. This is their place of choice. I want to accommodate them. Um, we're, so that's that's why you see this big boom of, of downtown housing. We're trying to make uh, room for those millennials because I don't want them to go out and rent an apartment next to Jordan Creek Mall if they want to live downtown. Let's get them someplace to live downtown. Um, so we're trying to balance the needs of a lot of different people. Um, and then I, I touched on it um, uh, with the you know the service sector jobs that people are having to uh, commute out further from further and further out so they can find housing that they can afford. I think there's a there's a transfer there's a very direct transportation and public transit tie in with the affordable housing argument. And how do you? Um, we work very closely uh, with DART and other transportation providers, but it's 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 hard to mesh it and integrate it all together. And then finally, that transportation argument comes down to a broader argument that I think we'll get into a little. The later is what is the suburbs role in affordable housing and transit and, and and providing opportunities for the workforce Des Moines proper is about 210,000 people so we're, we're we're not even half of the MSA 
Um, but uh, I would guess we have more than half the affordable housing in the MSA. Um, and those people uh, who live in Des Moines in affordable housing are commuting out for jobs and vice versa. And uh, what role does transportation play in that? Thanks. I, I didn't even have to. I didn't even have to cut you. Okay. Like right on, right on. Uh, so now we're gonna we're gonna shift over to Russ and think a little bit about one of those one one of the communities that is that is a little farther out. But you've also got your own draw yourself in in, in Grinnell, right? So. So it's 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 interesting to hear, Matt. We we actually had the exact opposite experience. All of our downtown housing is was uh, market rate housing. We had no um, no tax credit housing, no affordable housing. Uh, we, we undertook a large project uh, immediately adjacent to our downtown. That was our first uh, kind of big venture into that. Um, we just uh, opened that project, and, and since a lot of you may not get to Grinnell, I'll go through a couple slides here in a minute. But uh, I'm going to take a step back. Um, I've worked um, really all over Iowa, Spencer, Carroll, uh, Humboldt, and, and now 15 years in Grinnell. And one of the things I've heard pretty universally in all those locations is, you know, we have a housing problem. Well, very seldom do people drill into that as far as they should. Um, you know, most people, frankly, don't need to. That's not part of what they do. And that's something we spent a lot of time doing over the last couple of years, uh, was, was trying to really uh, uh, dissect what that meant for our community specifically. Um, we, we did all the things like typical housing studies um, and, and really put a lot of time and effort into those. But I have to give our Chamber of Commerce a lot of credit. Um, certainly not scientific wouldn't pass statistical muster, but one thing they did do is they were able to get in with all of our large employers, you know, Grinnell College, uh, Reinsurance, Brownells, the hospital, those kind of places. Um, and they were able to, on a monthly basis, meet with all the new hires from those communities and talk to them about what, what their experience was as they were trying to establish uh, residency in the community. And it was pretty alarming to us how many people uh, were, were, were frankly moving to the Altoonas, the Williamsburgs, because they could not find the housing uh, that, that they needed to make that transition. Uh, so what we determined was really missing from the community was something that allowed people to come in, get their established roots in the community, and then, and then take that next housing step. Um, so I, we continue to do that, and we still, um, each time we do that, we, we learn things that, uh, frankly, um, the housing studies don't always show us. And, and especially when I go back to, you know, to, to my bosses, Housing studies are great, but when I can show them that we've met with these people that are new residents to the community, and and I can show them, you know, exactly what they're saying, exactly what those challenges are, that that provides a lot of political cover for us. And the reason that that's important um, for a community like ours is, um, you know, I, I'm sure you guys here too. One of the things we ran into when we when we undertook the the Spalding Loss Project was um, there's this misnomer that it's going to be this. Um, this extremely low income uh, project, and 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 I, I'm going to maybe get myself in trouble, but the new, you know, there's uh, unfortunately, you know, racism's alive and well. What what we heard was, you know, you don't hear some of the really uh, overt racism that you used to hear. Now it's, you know, this is going to attract people from Chicago. Well, I think we all know exactly what people mean when they say that. Um, and then it was also starting to, it was starting to lease up during the. the, the all the rhetoric of the campaign. So there, I mean, it, it was really prevalent in the community that we were struck, you know, we were hearing people say it's gonna, you know, it, it's almost hard to believe, but you know, that people from Chicago are gonna arrive in train cars and that the Syrian refugees are coming. And, you know, so, you know, it, it's, it's been really exciting. Um, the, let's see, I might have these out of order. But, okay, so th there's an excerpt out of our housing study uh, that we just completed that basically shows that those Spalding Loft, the 60% uh, income affordable units are renting above market rate in Grinnell. And, I, and that, that's probably not something you guys experience in Des Moines necessarily, but um, when we were working with Chris Doris on that project, she tried to explain that to me. She said, you know, our affordable rates are probably gonna be higher than your current market rates. So that was a great thing to pull out of that study and present, you know, present to the media, present to my employers that said, you know, this is this is exactly the opposite of what you know some of the uh, the negative people were portraying. In that, you know, if you provide quality housing, even those affordable rates in rural Iowa, uh, in many times will exceed the market rates. So, so that project is pretty much leased out. Um, I'm happy to say it's it's rented by people that reflect the demographics of, of Iowa, and, and, and we welcome that. So. 
this is a project that um, Glenn Lyons and Marilyn Arbor, who um, obviously do a lot of work in the Des Moines area, have been helping us with. They use workforce housing credits for this. These are units that, uh, about 1,400 square feet, we're able to keep them below 200,000. That was another thing we heard from the people who were moving into the community is, uh, you know, especially if they're coming from Des Moines, they, they expect certain, uh, a certain diversity of housing. And something that's new, that's affordable, that they can that they can you know that they can live in and, and resell at a reasonable price. Um, we're just now uh, these two are done. There's two more that are being completed. They've they've been received really well in the community, um, and I think those units are actually one's filled by someone from Brownells and the other is from Grinnell Reinsurance. Um, we don't necessarily have neighborhoods in Grinnell that are that are that are vacant, but we do have um, individual scattered vacant properties. Uh, the council made these a priority uh, for us uh, a few years ago, and we've, we've gone through the tedious process of obtaining those through district court. Um, we've now redeveloped every single one of those lots with, with, um, with new housing. This is one example uh, that, that was, uh, I would like to have got better shots, but I, we had had to postpone the conference a week to get <laughs> sunshine in there, so it wasn't boring. Um, but, um, these have been really successful. I'm sure most of you are aware of the tax incentives you can offer to, to a property if it's an abandoned property. Um, I, I would say so many tax incentives we offer maybe uh, maybe don't provide the, uh, I guess how do I say, they don't, they don't provide the projects we necessarily want. The tax incentive that we're able to offer on these abandoned properties has been huge. Uh, you know, smart people uh, understand what that's worth to them you know, when they build these units, so. Um, Senior housing is a big deal for us too. We have we have two significant senior communities. Um, most of them are upper income. Our most recent housing housing study indicates that we probably need to take a step back. Uh, they're not necessarily meeting the needs of the lower income seniors, so that's the, that's a project we're addressing. Um, this uh, this is a project that was kind of a, a swing and a miss, but we're going to circle back on this one. Um, this goes back to that economy of scale that I talk about. So much of what we do in, in our community is one builder building one house at a time. And you know you just simply get no economy of scale in doing that. So our housing cost, you'd be surprised if you went and looked at housing in Grinnell, is probably consistently 25% higher than, than most of the areas you're gonna find in the metro. So that's something we're still wrestling with. We, we feel we need to do a project that has a little more uh, size to it. And, this is another example of that. Uh, this, uh, the one before this, actually Dennis Reynolds had, had helped us with, and this is one that uh, we've been working with Hubble on. Uh, we'll circle back with one of these two projects. The housing study we just did supports both of these, so uh, these are kind of next step projects for us. Dave has given us a, a, a lot of good, a lot of good context to, to chew on, and I and I love the idea of there being a variety of different solutions that we might be able to look into and this kind of unwritten rule that the downtown housing stock should mimic the downtown workforce and, and, and maybe you, there should be a broader unwritten rule about just the housing stock in the in the city in the region needs to reflect that as well uh, Sam and Carolyn do you do you have any uh, kind of thoughts and reflections here on just the the, the housing and economy connection as you're seeing it in the in the state well, um, Russ and I have known each other for a very, very long time, but I have to applaud him, um, you know, for actually looking at what the community needs, and, and Matt as well, versus what the community wants. I think the number one thing that we see as a developer is we go into communities and they say, well, you know, we want $200,000 homes uh, built on the edge of town, make them all nice, make them all ranch. Um, but, <laughs> they, yeah, two acres, right, right, and, yeah, and if you put whites only on there, no. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, I did, yes. I, no, no, I mean, that, that gets to my second point. Um, but the first is, is it, you know, what your community wants and what your community needs are often different things. And when you go out and hire a market analyst, um, you're probably going to get something that a lot of it was done at their desk. And so we really do need to be out. We need to be talking to employers. We need to be talking to these, these new people in our community and say not just what type of housing is appealing to you, but what community amenities are appealing to you. Um, and so that's, that's something else that we need to focus, or that's something we first need to focus on. And second is this NIMBY issue. We've got to have the conversation in Iowa that says, just because you make below a certain income does not mean that you are a bad or unruly 
person. And I can tell you from experience, because I do have market rate and affordable housing, that the, the labor in managing affordable housing is all the rules and regulations to make sure that people are still poor. It is not because they cause more trouble. Right now I have a very expensive engineer who's trying to completely rework the heating and cooling system in one of my buildings that's brand new. Um, so market rate people can actually be more trouble than, than your low income people, trust me. Um, but, but that's a stigma. Uh, and I think the other thing that we can do to that point uh, beyond having these NIMBY conversations is try and figure out how we can make it more user friendly to provide affordable housing. Again, if we have rules and regulations that are in place that, that are require 85% of a manager for low income uh, housing to spend on paperwork, a market rate manager gets to spend 100% of their time helping their people. Um, so I, I think those are some important conversations to have to move affordable housing sort of out of that cloud. Thank you. <laughs> so just to clarify, HIPA is the allocating agency for tax credits. So we were really good for downtown development. <coughs> we're accused of being the Pope County Housing Finance Agency. <laughs> so we, you know, the pendulum swung the other way. Um, and and I'm also the arbitrator of all the rules that uh, Sam wants me to. Well, no, not all Change. the rules. No, okay. city has them, county has them, sure. I just like to that. Um, and we've, you know, most of us have known each other a while. Um, I think the point Russ made about uh, rent is really crucial in the economics of rental housing. Um, we struggle with the fact, and, and my, my low-income advocates on staff always are worried that our tax credit rents are too high even though that is a federal rule and we can't change it. Um, it is usually, and you know, it doesn't surprise me that in Grinnell, they're the highest rents. Now, if you go to smaller communities, they're a good third higher than what they could actually get as market rents. So part of the problem is you have this legacy of, I wouldn't call slumlords, but not adequate rental housing that are still charging two, $300 a month. I was in Marcus, Iowa, which is not in which is three hours away, we went to talk about an eight unit, eight unit complex. So they need housing, just as other small communities do, because you're seeing an uptick in jobs, and they're understanding that just because they have the job doesn't mean they're going to grow. Uh, you have the small communities around the Winnebago plants and other things that are, are the new Polaris plant, where they're understanding, finally, that if I have the jobs, I need the people, and then finally, I need the housing. And you need all that in your geographic area, which means in the city limits to maintain that town. You won't maintain the schools if I'm the wage earner and come for the new job, and I live 20 miles away in the county seat because that's the only place I can find decent housing. Not even affordable. They're just looking for something they would actually live in. And if they become entrenched in the, in the city center in a different county, in a different county or a different city, they're not going to bring the family and move to the small town of Marcus when they all get together. So I'm trying to encourage that. But what we're finding is when a tax credit project goes into a community that hasn't had one in a while, the rest of the owner, rest of the owners of rental housing notice because they're starting to find that they become their vacancy rate goes up dramatically, um, even though they're going to pay more at the rental at the low tax low-income housing tax credit project, but they have to <coughs> increase their standards. So it's all about trying to get everybody up to decent housing. I will, I'll give you decent housing right now in some cases that in, in small communities in rural Iowa where they're paying three and $400 a month, but they're paying five and $600 a month for utilities because it's the old drafty farmhouse that somebody thought was a great idea. So, I mean, we see it across the country, across the state. Uh, it's just different nuances. You know, everybody would like to have Des Moines problems, I'm sure, but they wouldn't understand those types of problems. But they have them all in the microcosm of how to attract people to fill those jobs and then stay in their communities. 
we've heard a, a good mix of, <coughs> of solutions and challenges, and I, I'd like to I'd like to, to to dig in a little bit more about who who gets the challenge, who doesn't get the challenge. Like let's let's talk about let's talk about awareness because we could we could certainly if, if you know time allows we can dig into a lot of the different innovative solutions a lot more, but we can create all the solutions that, that we want, but if we can't sell somebody on them, if we can't sell our communities, our neighbors, our elected officials on them, um, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna be getting very far. So um, has, has the challenge in the communities where, where you've worked actually reached a point where the, the, the public is kind of on board, or are we still kind of uh, uh, struggling there? Yeah. I'm going to start teed up for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. Um, we've had two significant challenges in large communities where we would like to hope that those attitudes are not as prevalent. It's not, you know, my hometown of Plainfield with 300 people and they're you know, I'm pretty sure they're still all white. I haven't. I think they're all, you know, middle class farm community. So, but Cedar Rapids, we have struggled um, mightily with a low income housing tax credit project that, um, good or bad, has the moniker that they were in the set aside for serving persons who were previously homeless. So, I'm sure you can all guess what the issues were. The issues were, um, it was not zoned white for uh, rental housing. It was zoned commercial. So it wasn't going from you know, single family residential to commercial. Uh, so it was a slight change in my opinion of, of uh, status. So uh, they went to planning and zoning, and this is a large nonprofit out of Minnesota, so not new to struggles with dealing with unprogressive a nice word for the day. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they were awarded, we're excited about the project, we're trying to assist uh, people who were previously homeless and trying to not obviously going to be a silver bullet because four units isn't going to take it because I'm pretty sure there's more than four people. We didn't want to fall into only veterans because I think that's an easy place for people to feel better about themselves because they look at the veterans, not the fact that they do not have a home. They were awarded 800,000 in credits, which for them is $8 million over 10 years. Substantial, 40 units in Cedar Rapids, in a community who has cried to us several times about, we don't like them. Now I'm pretty sure I don't like them, but that's just <laughs> <laughs> This will get back to them when I talk. Their city manager will call me shortly, I'm sure. But, uh, I just texted you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always on my side. Yeah. yeah. Always on my side. Anyway, so we struggled with them. Uh, planning and zoning turned them down. Uh, the issues were uh, between, you know, water, street traffic, you know, the list that are safe things to say. Uh, then it went to the city council, and um, it, it short, quick answer is it went down um, pretty pretty vehemently and with some venom as well about discussing there would be homeless people on the street corner begging and I'm like, well the logic in me says they're actually in there. Living they are not on the street corner. And so highly disappointed, I know it's hard to tell. Um, but and it was our first foray as as a housing agency trying to provide dedicated units for people experiencing homelessness. We do those programs as well, and we know they need they need supportive housing. It's not, you know, as simple as finding them a place to live. They're not there just because they can't find an apartment in most cases. And the so, homeless are not just, you know, being shipped in no. from elsewhere. They're they're, not they're here already. Right. Right. They're not right. taking the mega bus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was very disappointing. Uh, so. It is still in flux. We're they're trying to go back for another reading, and then, and I don't know what I I don't see that anything has changed dramatically. Um, 
And I think the biggest thing that bothered me the most is we had a nonprofit uh, organization that their leader was one of the uh, residents crying about the water. And I had a frank conversation. Those of you who know me, I don't know any other kind of conversation I have. <laughs> so I said to her, I said, you cannot drop the mantle that you are director of a nonprofit dealing with homeless people and dealing with affordable housing and stand up and decry this project. And she said, well, I never said the organization was against it. I just had my concerns. And I think that was just very eye-opening. Because we all think we're all good. We all have a very good feeling about what we do. Even those for-profit guys are usually pretty good <laughs> yeah, who deal in affordable housing. But um, you know, it, it's a different thing when it comes close to home. You know, uh, it just was very disheartening on a lot of levels, and, and it, it made us pause. Now we have another project um, that was awarded for this homeless set aside, and it's in Des Moines. And is it, it zoned? For it's zoned. Or, yeah, <laughs> it's zoned. So we'll see how that goes. It's on the it's, uh, southeast fourteenth. So that it really gave us uh, it's given us a lot to think about uh, with with one. Big piece to underscore here, I mean, I, I mentioned earlier that Republicans and Democrats alike are behind regulatory reform. Republicans and Democrats alike and people in and outside of the nonprofit industry are also just as likely to be NIMBY. There's not, this is, housing is not a partisan issue. Housing affects, housing affects all of us. It affects the economy for, for everybody, but we're all kind of concerned about change. And if, Somebody can, can can paint change in a way that seems like it's um, it's going to be harmful and not just actually housing the people who already live here in a better way or housing the people who already work here in a better way. Um, we can get all of the all of the worst undercurrents that are um, barely hidden bubbling bubbling up and trying to figure out how to how to get past that is is, is key. If you or, or do you have a get past, or do you have a, a yeah, it's hard? Both. Um, well, I will say that even in smaller communities, community leadership uh, makes a bigger difference, right? So if you're in a town of 25,000 people, I'm going to throw out Clinton, Iowa, because I love it. We've done five projects there now, um, four historic, saved, iconic buildings that Iowa needs to have preserved. Um, but when a NIMBY issue comes up there, the councilman just looks at them and says, they do great work, these buildings are beautiful, thank you for your comments, go ahead and take a seat. That makes a difference when your leadership is saying very confidently, we've done our research, we know what we're doing, and we stand behind this. That, that makes a big difference in those mid-sized communities, in the larger communities. And, um, you know, I hadn't dealt with NIMBY, honestly, for about 12 years. Don't worry, I'm not going to name names so you guys can sit back up and you know what's going on there. But uh, recently, actually this year, uh, we dealt with NIMBY for the first time in probably 15 years. Um, and I will say it was a direct effect of the rhetoric that was going on in the political climate because that project had been around for a year and a half. And nobody had a problem. Everybody thought it was wonderful. We were going to save a historic school. Fantastic. But then we have this poisoned rhetoric going on on a national level, and we're all fighting and we're all hating each other, and all of a sudden that became an issue, something that everybody really knows in their heart is a good thing, everybody really knows is going to help that area, became contentious. And I think we're all responsible for that at coffee shops and, and, and all the conversations that we have. The Polk County Housing Trust Fund did a phenomenal job of supporting the project and trying to get education out. Um, and they've run several campaigns called Can I Be Your Neighbor? Um, but I think individual cities need to come on board with that as well. And, and we all need to stand up and say, you know, if there's a problem, we'll deal with it. But how many, I mean, honestly, how many of these poison, horrible properties where, you know, murders and rapes and everything else are happening daily are there in Iowa? Let's be honest about who we are. Um, and if we do see problems, we need to come together and tackle it. And that's my next issue, which is, um, when we when we're in cities uh, where you know they're 
they're inspecting us and doing all of these things, I, I hope that they're holding other landlords to those same standards. And by that, I mean single family. Are yes. renting out homes. I do a background check. I do a criminal credit. I, you know, but they don't. And we're not going to bring neighborhoods back up until we're holding these people who are raking in profits and letting children eat hit yes. to a higher yes. standard. Here, here. I, I, I'm glad. I'm glad that got some applause because see, that's uh, quite quite serious. So I want to. Uh, I want to remind everybody that we we don't have tons of time, but I want to have some opportunity for questions. So if you start thinking about those, I'm going to figure out if there's a, a, a mic to pass. But um, for us, it looks like you want to chime in. Sure, I was just going to touch on what Sam said a little bit. We uh, we had actually gone through the. We're a community of under 15,000, so we're not required to do uh, rental inspections. We we uh, we developed a program to do it uh, voluntarily, and as we were bringing that through the city council, the landlords in the community, as you can imagine. Um, showed up at meetings and, and we were not able to implement that, but very consciously, um, you know, these, we heard from these same people when we started to develop newer products for the market, and uh, it has increased their vacancy rate, but um, I, I, would, I would actually pay someone in this room to do an expose in our community and propose as a, uh, someone who's new to the community, looking for an apartment, you make 35000 a year. Um, I've, I've had to talk to employees that I've hired off a cliff um, I don't know, I think a lot of people in the room know Kay Smellick who um, mm. came to help us. And um, she, we hired her, everything was fine. I, I had to rehire her after she looked for housing in the community. So it's it's really helpful for us that we've had staff and other people experience those things in the community. But back to the issue about awareness. Um, you know, I have a council, I have a fantastic city council. They've mostly lived in their houses for 20, 30 years. They haven't experienced this. Um, and again, like I said, most people in the community don't need to read housing studies. This isn't what they do. But they see that there's 100 houses on the market. They, it's hard for them to comprehend how there can be um, a housing shortage. And, and I go back to that. You know, we had to take a lot of time, I mean years, to, to really drill into that and convince people that there was a housing shortage. Um, I'll, a quick story, and then I'll be done. Um, even some of the staff, um, the, the Spalding project that I showed you, um, our city hall is actually attached to that project. Uh, physically attached to that building, and um, even some of our staff were uh, were skeptical of that project and who was living there. And there's um, apparently there's this young man who lived there is very handsome, and now comes uh, comes in to pay his water bill, and all work stops. And now they, everybody loves that project now. So if you, if you can bring something like that, it really changes. Yeah, can I meet your neighbor? That's really the point I'm making. Is when these projects are done, um, it may seem silly, but introduce those people to your, you know, the decision makers, exactly. and and let let them tell their stories. Um, the chambers also work with us on that a little bit. Of you know, people that have moved, and you know, we have a we have a young lady that works at the hospital who could not find housing. Uh, that product became available. She's happy as can be. She's actually told her story to a couple of people, and it's been really helpful. I'm glad you brought up the 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 role, not just of awareness for community members, but awareness at the, the city council level. People, people who are in elected official roles, and, and frankly, a lot of people in roles around, around communities ha are among those who have been in the community for quite a long time. And that, and that makes, makes utter sense, but it also clarifies a little bit why there might be awareness gaps of not really understanding until maybe they see their kids trying to find a place to live or their parents trying to figure out how to, to stay afloat. Um, while we're waiting to see if we've got a, a question, I'd love for everybody to say like the super micro, you know, elevator soundbite version of where you think some of these other uh, awareness is issues stand uh, from your community's perspective. I'll go. Um, obviously Des Moines has, we have our own um, or our own challenges and opportunities, but in the Des Moines Metro, the, the, the discussion and dialogue needs to be broader. It needs to be Des Moines in the suburbs. Um, I don't, well, I will pick on some. Um, you know, if, how many, how many low-income housing tax credit awards have been given to Waukee and Clive and Urbandale and Ankeny in the last five years? Probably none, right? No, so. Des there has been, I don't think it's But we're, we're shoulder, Des Moines is shouldering uh, a, uh, an unfair burden of the affordable housing uh, need in Des Moines. It needs to be. It needs to be a broader discussion. But it's not to argue. 
You can argue, please. Your characterization that those projects are a burden is troublesome because mm -hmm. we view it, other communities who don't get them, yeah. view it as an opportunity. Right. It's, a, it's, so. it, it's, it's actually holding those communities back from an economic development standpoint. So picture your Ankeny. And all the big box no the big box retailers and the, gro and the grocery stores and the, <coughs> and, the, um, and, the, and the restaurants and the hotels they have there, those from an economic development standpoint, it is holding them back because uh, without an adequate affordable housing, the the uh, the housing stock is being supplied by Des Moines, and that's that's out of balance. With the jobs where the jobs are versus where the where the housing is. Yeah, so there's a there's a kind of reframing that I'm hearing here. I'm needing to make sure that the other communities see their lack of more affordable options as a burden on them. Yes. And and maybe there's maybe there's there's mapping to be done about the the, the, the commuting flows, really clarifying and understanding, you know, what where is that, you know, if we thought about your unwritten rule, you know, does the do the people working in those communities have a place that they could live in that community? Is the stop appropriate for it and, and getting the conversation kind of driving around um, that way. Do we have any uh, questions? Um, I just realized, is mine really a question or do I just want the microphone? No, what, I, I've worked in this a long time and so it used to be low to moderate income housing was the term it seems to me, and then we kind of switch to affordable housing to make it better. But now we're running into that with affordable housing. So I've heard stable housing as a, as a possibility. This was in a small committee meeting I was at in the, in the same dreaded town that Carol Ann was talking about with the project. Um, so I like that term, but I would just like guess like everybody's thoughts about that. And the other thing is that's kind of frustrating to me is this whole workforce housing term and it's been around a long time because I got IDEB funds I think in 96 maybe that used that term so it's been around a while but it also helps it reinforces what people think about affordable housing because they think there's a distinction between um, people working and, and that qualify for workforce housing and folks that need affordable housing that maybe aren't working, which of course we all know in this room probably is not true. But anyway, I would like your thoughts about that. Well, um, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Right? There's industry terms that we use that we should use in the industry world and should not use outside the industry world and trying to figure out how to get around that. What are what are some of your thoughts here? Well, I think you should just use housing and Thank you. actually use the word home. Because we've quit using, we've tried to quit in any of our stuff talking about units. Because units very much demoralizes and makes it not connectable to anybody else. So, um, you know, my public relations director doesn't like to use low income housing tax credits. We use housing tax credit term, which sometimes is, you know, is, it definitely works with everybody outside the industry. But I think if you could just talk about homes for people, in your community and all of us just get off whatever we want to label it because Matt and I were just talking about you know workforce is the new because that's the term if you go to smaller communities is the term we use because none of them think they have those low income people in whatever town which I know is good whatever but you know just homes we've worked on trying to make the word home because that just has everybody has a better connotation than housing units or Apartments, even. I mean, Phoenix School, which, you know, has raised the bar that maybe includes rentals. It doesn't just include affordable rentals. They didn't even like rentals, which was ironic because we were also in in that deal on on a, on a new program. But um, I think if you could frame the conversation to those people who just who may or may not, they don't know what they feel about the people in those homes until you throw words to give them a place to land. And if we start talking about, you know, safe, decent sounds like it, you know, it has running water and electricity, barely. <laughs> Stable makes me think of, I want a horse. And so we all bring, <laughs> you all bring different connotations to different words and it does matter. And I know 
know we can get into the nuances of it, but I think if we just talk about homes and a place to live in the community where they want to be a part of it. Here, here. I, I'm sure everyone will be surprised by the issue that I bring up, which is, just speaking of terminology, aging in place is one that we'd like to discard as well. But we had Dan Polorik in last December for a, a community report. He talked a lot about missing middle. And that whole conversation really caught fire. And in the suburbs, uh, they would define a, a, different, a little bit different problem that they've come up with, and that is that a lot of the automobile dependent cul-de-sac type developments are increasingly occupied by widows who ha have uh, either not the wherewithal or whatever, to, you know, the housing is deteriorating so much. They, so the missing middle they saw as a, as a response to continuing to maintain the social network in those suburban communities and revitalizing those automobiles neighborhoods. We want to continue that conversation, you know, because so much of what's happening in Des Moines is right in that missing middle sweet spot. And, you know, the age-dependent housing, it's only about 4% of the people uh, who are in those, you know, only 4% of the population that's 50 plus are in age-defined housing. So, given that, I, you know, a couple of you mentioned the suburbs, so I want to throw out that that's what we've heard from the suburbs about their first challenge. And as city managers, how would you respond to that? And, and as developers and, and that sort of thing, do you see an opportunity there? And is there a missing middle opportunity that 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 is a mix of market rate and subsidized or whatever the right word is? So I'm, I'm going to just uh, let us all know, the panelists know that we've got about two minutes left. So we're going to be quick in answering that really core question. And if you have another also very uh, succinct kind of closing thought that you, that you, that you want to share, please go ahead and do so. And, and I'm, I'm apologize. I don't think I'm going to answer your question, but I, I'm hoping Matt will. But the one thing I'll close with is we, we, we've, engaged our, we've engaged our large employers. Um, you know, we, we provide, just like a lot of cities, we've, we provide incentives to our uh, business and industry. And we've started to direct some of those, and it gets a little tricky legally, but we've been able to direct some of those incentives that they now they now are making investments in some of the housing projects we're doing because frankly one of the biggest challenges we have is finding capital for projects and now we're basically saying, hey, you're going to use part of that as capital for this stuff and we've been able to maneuver um, legally around some of that. Uh, we're just now getting into that stage, but I've been I've been pleasantly surprised how uh, excited and how well they've embraced that some stuff. So with, that's kind of our next yeah. step is engaging them in that. So not in the middle and other things. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a really succinct answer to your question. Maybe we can talk afterward sure. um, to, to wrap this up quickly. Um, uh, in, in, to, to summarize, um, tying housing to economic development. In my, if, if I'm naive, maybe I'm mean naive in wanting this, but I would, I would, uh, the cities working with primarily Iowa Economic Development Authority and Care Lands Group and the Iowa Finance Authority, I would love to package up a tool whereby, if, I'm gonna give the example, so we uh, we had a large employer called Cognizant who was uh, has a major expansion planned in Des Moines over the next few years. They're gonna add hundreds of jobs and they're all right in that 60% of area median income sweet spot. Um, I would love to have a, a process in place where there, if there's city incentives in a project and, and state incentives in a project, that somehow also comes coupled with that some assistance for housing. It's not as necessary in Des Moines because we have the housing, but when I think of a Grinnell or a Marcus or somebody, so if I'm a if I'm Grinnell and I get, uh, if I go land a large manufacturer and, and I bring 100 jobs, um, and exactly everything you just said about not having the housing, wouldn't it be great if you had, if you had an IFA tool that came with the IEDA app, uh, award that maybe it's an extra five points on your QA on your on your application for credits or it's I don't I don't know what the tool is or the mechanism to bundle uh, products together but that way the two state agencies in the city uh, are working together it, it, again probably more applicable to a much smaller community than it is to Des Moines um, but that's 
So Carolyn, either you're like you're free to respond or not to respond since we've got like you know less than thirty. We're 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 actually slightly over, but I'm just gonna, gonna let you let, let you each have micro moments. Okay. We're we're okay. Right. We established a new program in 2015 that's trying to get at the knowledge of 60 percent and 80 percent and try to just gloss over that. We call it workforce housing loan. So. To us, we've tried to address that outside the bounds of federal rules because we believe it's in, there's just a lot of strings attached with tax credits. It's highly competitive. We only have $7 million. Uh, so we set aside $5 million of IFA funds <coughs> to provide loans to communities so that they could do rental housing however they choose. Um, you know, we're going to go back and look at that program, but we, we, we pair that. We believe we, we're trying to pair that with the communities who are seeing an increase in jobs or even within the county seeing increase in jobs. Low unemployment, they really need it and it doesn't take a genius to figure out that they need housing, which I you know I think we all understand. It actually was started because of Grinnell and the community conversations we've had with <coughs> Grinnell, not specifically with Russ, but with the Chamber and then also with the City of Jefferson. Both communities we knew needed housing um, and so we started this program. There might be some nuances we could work with. Everybody likes a grant, but my CFO wants me to have some return on investment since we generate our own funds and I steal them. So, Excuse me. but we're going to work on that and have larger discussions with communities and, and as, are there things we can do differently to make it more attractive beyond making it just a grant. So that's, that's how we're trying to address those out of the box, not federal programs, not having all the limitations, and because we, income limitations are 95000 a year on the family, so we think pretty much everybody who's going to do rental would fit into that category. Sam? I will say that is a great tool, and thank you very much for less streams. Carolyn? <laughs> uh, no, no, it, it is working great, and, and Iowa needs to do a little bit more thinking outside the box. Um, we've been blown away by Minnesota, who has a lot more state investment uh, programs, and Iowa needs to step it up a little bit. Uh, is my PR guy still breathing? If, if he's uh -huh. not, I'll say this. Um, you know, if we can give 50000 or $50 million to a chemical plant, we could probably create a $50 million fund to help housing. Um, sorry, guy. Um, but I will also, the last thing I want to say is preservation, preservation, preservation. Yes, I'm a historic preservationist, but, you know, some of these, like the Aplex in Marcus, you know, maybe they don't need additional housing. They just need that brought brought up to modern standards. Um, the, the project IFA just awarded us in Spencer, 100 units, they're seniors. They've got baseboard heat. They've got vinyl floors. They have uh, two burner stoves. These seniors have... You know, because it's affordable and that's the only place they can live, we're going to come in and we're going to modernize that, make it marketable. Yeah. So it's not just about building that new housing, it's about preserving and investing in what we have. And also, we have this treasure trove of buildings, we need to all come together to figure out how to use those. Um, because a lot of, I, I think key to Russ's point, maybe a new construction apartment wouldn't have been as well received as the Spalding Manufacturing. Because it's hip, it's cool, it's funky, everybody wants hardwood. HGTV has actually done a great job of making us all realize how much cooler, yes. <laughs> you know, historic buildings and downtown housing can be. So um, I would say preserve. Fantastic. You, you've all been, you've all been wonderful. <laughs> I wish I had I wish I had started this so much earlier because there are so many questions left on the table and things to continue thinking about about how we actually talk about communicate the issues create solutions and get to looking kind of at the, the, the person in the mirror and our potential role as one of the NBs or one of the parts of the solution too so thanks very much I'm gonna hand it back to Eric thanks a lot again another hand for uh, Maya for our panel Yeah, there's a lot left on the table, and we're we're going to send you uh, we're going to send you back to Washington, with the rest of us uh, in this room get to continue to uh, carry on the discussion from here and the trust fund and, and our partners intend to be a catalyst to do that. 
uh, because there are a lot of, of, of issues that have been raised, potential solutions that have been raised, um, but I think um, equally as important um, is that I hope people walk out of here today if they didn't have an appreciation uh, for the, the issue before, well, certainly uh, an appreciation for the urgency of the issue uh, for Central Iowa, that, uh, that that's what you take away uh, from, from this symposium. I think there are some things that, uh, that I know that, that I've heard that, that I like. I like, the, I like the idea of going to, our, to the HR departments of our largest employers and say, give me the names of the last 10 people you hired. And, 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 and let me email them and see if they'll talk to us about you know, how they found housing, what kind of housing they looked for, what their challenges were, what was missing, and begin to use some of that quantitative information that we can find that may be outside of the housing studies that, and the data that we have that actually talk to folks that have faced the challenge of trying to find a place that they wanted to live in central Iowa and what their compromises had to be. So I think that uh, there'll be some talk about that going forward, whether it's something that the Polk County Housing Trust Fund does or something that we do in connection uh, with the Greater Des Moines Partnership and their relationship with the business community it would be certainly nice to have those stories and some of that information a year from now when we do uh, affordable housing week number five we'll start talking about uh, about folks actual uh, uh, actual experiences in uh, in coming to des moines so um, i'm going to close it uh, the students uh, have agreed to hang around for a little bit if you want to uh, if you didn't get to all of the posters and want to and want to talk to them. Uh, some of the best opportunities and some of the best ideas come from table talk. Uh, there is, you know what? I think the landlords did better than you guys. Yeah. Did better yesterday getting rid of the food than you guys. Did. <laughs> uh, we can't let that happen. So go back, pick up, you know, pick up another cup of coffee. Feel free to uh, to hang around. Um, thank you to our sponsors that we've talked about before, but I especially want to thank uh, my staff. Um, the Polk County Housing Trust Fund has an amazing staff that puts all of this together uh, every year. Uh, give, a, give a special uh, shout out to Tom. So, um, if you have any questions, you know where to find us, PCHTF. Org and uh, have a have a drive trip home. It's not great. So I guess it was, so I guess being here was worth it. We got, <laughs> you get to leave without your umbrella. Thanks a lot. Thanks for. And if we start talking about uh, you know safe decent sounds like it you know it has running water and electricity barely. <laughs> Stable makes me think of on a horse, and so we all bring we all bring different connotations to different words, and it does matter. And I know we can get into the nuances of it, but I think if we just talk about homes and a place to live in the community where they want to be a part of it. Here, here. I, I'm sure everyone will be surprised by the issue that I bring up, which is. Speaking of terminology, aging in place is one that we'd like to discard as well. But we had Dan Polorik in last December for a, a community report. He talked a lot about missing middle. And that whole conversation really caught fire. And in the suburbs, uh, they would define a, a, different, a little bit different problem that they've come up with. And that is that a lot of the automobile dependent cul-de-sac type developments are increasingly occupied by widows who ha have uh, either not the wherewithal or whatever, to, you know, the housing is deteriorating so much. They, so the missing middle they saw as a, as a response to continuing to maintain the social network in those urban communities and revitalizing those automobile dependent neighborhoods. 
we want to continue that conversation, you know, because so much of what's happening in Des Moines is right in that miss in the middle sweet spot. And you know, the age dependent housing, it's only about four percent of the people uh, who are in those, you know, only four percent of the population that's fifty plus are in age defined housing. So given that I you know, a couple of you mentioned the suburbs, so I want to throw out that that's what we've heard from the suburbs about their first challenge. And as city managers, how would you respond to that? And, and as developers and, and that sort of thing, do you see an opportunity there? And is there a missing middle opportunity that 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 is a mix of market rate and subsidies or whatever the right word is? So I'm I'm gonna just uh, let us all know, the panelists know that we've got about two minutes left. So we're gonna be we're gonna be quick in answering that really core question. And if you have another also very uh, succinct kind of closing thought that you that you, that you want to share, please go ahead and do so. And, and I'm I'm apologize. I don't think I'm gonna answer your question, but I the one thing I'll close with is we, we, we've engaged our we've engaged our large employers. Um, you know, we we provide just like a lot of cities, we we provide incentives to our uh, business and industry, and we've started to direct some of those. And it gets a little tricky legally, but we've been able to direct some of those incentives that they now they now are making investments in some of the housing projects we're doing. Because frankly, one of the biggest challenges we have is finding capital for projects. And now we're basically saying, hey, you're going to use part of that as capital for this stuff. And we've been able to maneuver. Uh, Legally around some of that, uh, we're just now getting into that stage. But I've been I've been pleasantly surprised how uh, excited and how well they've embraced that some of the stuff. So with, that's kind of an our next step is engaging them in that process. So, and so Matt, the same middle and other funds. Uh, I don't know if I have a, a really succinct answer to your question. Maybe we can talk afterward. Sure. Um, to, to wrap this up quickly. Um. Uh. In, in, to to summarize. Um, Tying housing to economic development, in my, if, if I'm naive, maybe I'm mean naive in wanting this, but I would, I would, uh, the cities working with primarily Iowa Economic Development Authority and Carol Ann's group and the Iowa Finance Authority, I would love to package up a tool whereby, if I'm going to give the example, so we, uh, we had a large employer called Cognizant who was uh, has a major expansion plan in Des Moines over the next few years. They're going to add hundreds of jobs, and they're all right in that 60% of area minimum income sweet spot. Um, I would love to have a, a process in place where, there, if there's city incentives in a project and, and state incentives in a project, that somehow also comes coupled with that some assistance for housing. It's not as necessary in Des Moines because we have the housing. But when I think of a Grinnell or a Marcus or somebody, so if I'm a if I'm Grinnell and I get uh, if I go land a large manufacturer and and I bring 100 jobs. Um, and exactly everything you just said about not having the housing, wouldn't it be great if you had if you had an IFA tool that came with the IEDA app, uh, award? That maybe it's an extra five points on your QA on your on your application for credits, or it's, I don't I don't know what the tool is or the mechanism to bundle uh, products together. But that way, the two state agencies in the city uh, are working together. It, again, probably more applicable to a much smaller community than it is to Des Moines. Um, but that's, I, I, so, Carol Ann, either you're like you're free to respond or not to respond, since we've got like you know less than thirty. We're 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 actually slightly over, but I'm just gonna, gonna let you let, let you each have micro moments. Okay, we're we're okay. Right. We established a new program in 2015 that's trying to get at the knowledge of 60 percent and 80 percent, and try to just gloss over that. We call it workforce housing loan. So to us, we've tried to address that outside the bounds of federal rules because we believe it's in, there's just a lot of strings attached with tax credits. It's highly competitive. We only have $7 million. Uh, so we set aside $5 million of IFA funds <coughs> to provide loans to communities so that they could do rental housing however they choose. Um, you know, we're going to go back and look at that program, but we, we we pair that, we believe, we, we're trying to pair that with the communities who are seeing an increase in jobs or even within the county seeing an increase in jobs. Low unemployment, they really need it and it doesn't take a genius to figure out that they need housing, which I, you know, I think we all understand. It actually was started because of Grinnell and the community conversations we've had with <coughs> Grinnell 
not specifically with Russ, but with the Chamber, and then also with the City of Jefferson. Both communities we knew needed housing, um, and so we started this program. There might be some nuances we could work with. Everybody likes a grant, but my CFO wants me to have some return on investment, since we generate our own funds and I steal it. So, Excuse me. but we're going to work on that and have larger discussions with communities and, and as, are there things we can do differently to make it more attractive beyond making it just a grant. So that's, that's how we're trying to address those out of the box, not federal programs, not having all the limitations and because we, income limitations are 95,000 a year on the family. So we think pretty much everybody who's going to do rental would fit into that category. I will say that is a great tool and thank you very much for less streams to Caroline. <laughs> no, no, it, it is working great and, and Iowa needs to do a little bit more thinking outside the box. Um, we've been blown away by Minnesota who has a lot more state investment uh, programs and Iowa needs to step it up a little bit. Uh, is my PR guy still breathing? If, if he's not, I'll say this, um, you know, if we can give 50000 or $50 million to a chemical plant, we could probably create a $50 million fund to help housing. Um, sorry, guy. Um, but I will also, the last thing I want to say is preservation, preservation, preservation. Yes, I'm a historic preservationist, but, you know, some of these, like the Aplex in Marcus, you know, maybe they don't need additional housing. They just need that brought brought up to modern standards. Um, the, the project I've just awarded us in Spencer, 100 units, they're seniors, they've got baseboard heat, they've got vinyl floors, they have uh, two burner stoves. These seniors have, you know, because it's affordable and that's the only place they can live, we're gonna come in and we're gonna modernize that, make it marketable. Yeah. So it's not just about building that new housing, it's about preserving and investing in what we have. And also, we have this treasure trove of buildings, we need to all come together to figure out how to use those. Um, because a lot of, I, I think key to Russ's point, Maybe a new construction apartment wouldn't have been as well received as the Spalding Manufacturing because it's hip, it's cool, it's funky. Everybody wants hardwood. HGTV has actually done a great job of making us all realize how much cooler yes. you know, historic buildings and downtown housing can be. So um, I would say preserve. Fantastic. You, you've all been, you've all been, I wish I had I wish I had started this so much earlier because there are so many questions left on the table and things to continue thinking about about how we actually talk about communicate the issues create solutions and get to looking kind of at the, the, the person in the mirror and our potential role as one of the NBs or one of the parts of the solution too so thanks very much I'm gonna hand it back to Eric thanks a lot again another hand for uh, Maya for our panel There's a lot left on the table, and we're we're going to send you uh, we're going to send you back to Washington with the rest of us uh, in this room again to continue to uh, carry on the discussion from here and the trust fund <coughs> and, and our partners intend to be a catalyst to do that and because there are a lot of, of, of issues that have been raised, potential solutions that have been raised, um, but I think um, equally as important. Um, is that I hope people walk out of here today if they didn't have an appreciation uh, for the, the issue before, or well, certainly uh, an appreciation for the urgency of the issue uh, for Central Iowa, that, uh, that that's what you take away uh, from, from this symposium. I think there are some things that, uh, that I know that, that I've heard that, that I like I like the I like the idea of going to our to the HR departments of our largest employers and say, give me the names of the last ten people you hired, and 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 let me email them and see if they'll talk to us about you know how they found housing, what kind of housing they looked for, what their challenges were, what was missing and begin to use some of that quantitative information that we can find that may be outside of the housing studies that, and the data that we have, but actually talk to folks that have faced the challenge of trying to find 
a place that they wanted to live in central Iowa and what their compromises had to be. So I think that uh, there'll be some talk about that going forward, whether it's something that the Polk County Housing Trust Fund does or something that we do in connection uh, with the Greater Des Moines Partnership and their relationship with the business community. It would be certainly nice to have those stories and some of that information a year from now when we do uh, Affordable Housing Week number five, we'll start talking about, uh, about folks' actual, uh, uh, actual experiences in, uh, in coming to Des Moines. So um, I'm going to close it. Uh, the students uh, have agreed to hang around for a little bit. If you want to, uh, if you didn't get to all of the posters and want to, and want to talk to them, uh, some of the best opportunities and some of the best ideas come from table talk. Uh, there is, you know what, I think the landlords did better than you guys. Yeah. Did better yesterday getting rid of the food than you guys did. <laughs> uh, we can't let that happen. So go back, pick up, you know, pick up another cup of coffee. Feel free to, uh, to hang around. Um, thank you to our sponsors that we've talked about before, but I especially want to thank uh, my staff. Um, the Polk County Housing Trust Fund has an amazing staff that puts all of this together uh, every year. Uh, give, a, give a special uh, shout out to Tom. If you have any questions, you know where to find us, pchtf.org, and uh, have a have a drive trip home. It's not great. So I guess it was, so I guess being here was worth it. We got <laughs> you get to leave without your umbrella. Thanks a lot. Thanks for our